Hi, John here. I've been really struggling with, you know, this particular topic, you know, how should I go about presenting and you know, programming in Z80 assembly language? Uh, also considering the fact that you've got several uh, tutorials already on even YouTube for free that you can watch. And there's a lot of documentation out there already. You know, what, what, what could I bring to the table that isn't already done, you know, it'd be an insult to you and waste all of our time if I just record the same thing everyone else is doing, which is one of the things I really try not to do on my channel. I will look around a little bit and say, did anyone else do this? No, then I should do it. Somebody should do it anyway. Um, so I'm going to take a little different tact here. Um, and rather than actually going over, you know, like everyone else does, you say, here, here's an instruction, it does this and that and so on. And we might do that with one or two instructions, but I think it's more important, in my opinion, that you learn how to think about the machine than it is to just memorize a bunch of instructions. Truth is, I, no one really, well, maybe somebody would, but I would be willing to bet that most, the vast majority of most programmers don't memorize all the instructions of a machine. They will simply remember all the ones they use all the time, the instructions that is, and operations and things like that, but they'll keep a reference on hand. You know, so really this is about understanding how to efficiently use the instruction set reference that Zilog published, you know, decades ago. There will be links to the documents that you see in this video uh, below in the description on YouTube if you want to get copies of these. They're floating all over the internet, okay? This first document here is a manual that came from Zilog. It looks like somebody paid seven bucks and 50 cents for it back in the day. This is the ZAD Assembly Language Programming Manual, the real deal from the horse's mouth, okay? Now, if you scroll through this, uh, what you have, first of all, look at look at the way this was created. Must have been printed out. I don't know a line printer or a daisy wheel. You can see the letters don't even line up vertically; they're just bashed on the page. The font here doesn't even match the one over there. This is half laid out by hand. I mean, wow! You know, somebody really put a lot of effort into this. This, I believe, is the root, the original version of what I'm going to show you here that has been reproduced all over the place. For example, when I first learned Z80 Assembler, the manual that I used was the TRS-80 Model 2 EdTez manual from Microsoft, which consists of 10 pages of an introduction that was written by somebody at Microsoft, followed by a exact replica of this manual. All right, for two or 300 pages. What do we got? 304 pages uh, is what this thing is, uh, this PDF, okay? Or you got, well, 290 you know, plus the appendix and stuff like that, right? So um, basically the bottom, and, and, and so what you can see here, look, the instruction set starts on page 24 and it ends with an index on 275. So basically what this manual is, is a dump of just one instruction per page kind of a thing. So let's look at this really quick. This is how I originally learned it. And a lot of friends, I asked them, when you learned Assembler, what did you, you know, what, what did you learn? They said, oh, the Z80 Ed Teza manual was great. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It's a copy of this. So Xilog gifted this thing. It's reproduced in, in a lot of uh, how-to assembler uh, language uh, programming uh, guides and stuff over the years, all right? <laughs> Looking back, it's obvious that this is where it all came from. So... Let's start with this and move forward, okay? So what do they got? They got a little bit of an introductory in here, and then they talk about the fact that the Z80 has these registers and they have these names and stuff like that. They, there's some notations here, and I'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, it will tell you things like if you have a mathematical operation, then you must store the result in the accumulator, the A register. And A also must be one of the parameters for most of the, uh, you know, the 8-bit arithmetic and logical operations, okay? You can group these registers into pairs. A, B and C together can be used as a 16-bit value. Well, B can be used as 8 bits, C can be used as 8 bits, and so on. This is, you know, the same as, by the way, the people that designed the Z80 were the people that designed the 8080 when they worked at Intel. They left 
They formed a new company called Zilog. They built the Z80 to be machine code compatible with the 8080 and had enhanced features like, ooh, <laughs> it runs on five volts instead of multiple different voltages. It has an easier to, 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 to use a bus interface and a clock that, that runs in a simple square wave and so on. All right. You won't find anybody doing retro 8080 projects unless they you know really want to get into uh, a, a lot of extra circuitry. Uh, it's been out of the 8080 has been out of production for many years while the Z80 still persists. And that's really why. Okay. Just FYI. And what's the aside on all this? I bring that up because the 8080 at Intel predates the 8085, which predates the 8086, which predates the 186, 286, 386, 486 Pentium and all their core, this, that, and every other daggone thing. Okay. <laughs> it all starts with these registers and the idea that you can pair them together and have like the high half and the low half of a register. Uh, so if you know how to write, uh, uh, you know, uh, assembler, uh, I should say assembly is the name of the language, right? Assembler is the software that assembles the assembly language into an executable, right? I don't want to perpetuate the casual uh, misunderstanding of which is which, by the way, by misspeaking in here. I apologize. Anyway, so if you've ever written an assembly language program for a PC, you're already dealing with, you know, the BC registers and so on, all right? Does this really, it did, it started back in the day. And uh, the Z80, like I said, is a uh, clone of the 8080 plus a bunch of extra instructions. And that's actually important to know for another reason, because if you're going to use the Z80 in a machine to run, say, CPM programs and things like that, the programs may be written in 8080 assembler, or they might be written in Z80 assembler. And for legal reasons, uh, Zilog couldn't name their instructions the same as Intel. They can have the same numeric value, so the machine language is compatible. But they couldn't say move, for example, the contents of like the register B into the register A. So Zilog said load, all right? <laughs> and so they have different names, but they're really the same, okay? So one of the things you're going to get into if you're playing around with Z80s, especially if you're going to be using CPM, is a mixed bag of 8080 and Z80 instructions, all right? So just beware of that. Uh, okay, so what is going on here? They're going to tell you how, how many bits are in a byte and things like that. The fact that you can pair these things together, B and C together, and so on. The Z80 beyond the 8080 has these ideas of the index registers, index X, index Y. There's also a stack pointer register that's in the 8080 and the Z80 as well. The HL register is just another register pair. OK, uh, but it has a lot of instructions that are really tailored to use the HL pair for specialized purposes, just like the accumulator. The A register is specialized and that I mentioned earlier, it is very uh, uh, tied to uh, arithmetic and logic operations, or should I say the 8-bit arithmetic and logic operations, okay? The H and L registers, or more accurately, the pair together, are very uh, much associated with being used to refer to a memory address. Think of it as a pointer uh, variable like in a C program, okay? As are the index X and the index Y register pairs. Those two are really uh, specialized uh, in that they're mostly used as uh, address pointers, okay? All right, what else do we got going on down here? They, there's a format uh, when you type in an instruction, like say I want to load into, the way you read this is the, almost all the operations on the Z80 uh, 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 assembly language and the 8080 as well, uh, the destination is on the left. It's not always true for other CPUs. So you, number one, <laughs> where the Z80 is concerned, when you say I want to do something like load, I think of it in terms of load into the thing on the left from the thing on the right. Okay, source on the right, destination on the left when it comes to uh, Z80 and the 8080, okay? Um, 
that's one thing. How do labels work? Uh, if you, I, I assume you have some familiarity with assembly language. The idea being that you can uh, put together a, a bunch of instructions and then refer to the memory addresses where the instructions are stored by putting a label in your source code. Uh, by marking where something is, and then refer back to that label. We'll see that when we look at some code in a minute, all right? So what do we got going on here? This is the old-fashioned way of, of um, referring to something as a hexadecimal constant, right? And I'm learning right now. I never noticed I could put a negative in front of it. This probably calculates the twos complement. Uh, yeah, note the negative of an expression can be formed by preceding minus sign. Ah, we're all learning something today. Why? I have never done this in my life. Okay, <laughs> I've never needed to put a negative uh, constant. I would either put the actual hex value in there and do it myself, or not never really need a negative. Okay. Uh, point is, if you can have a literal in your program that is hex, you can put a h after it. Okay, and apparently I can put a minus in front of it. If it's lacks the h then you have a decimal value and of course that would not be legal because e is not a valid digit in the decimal number right now i tend to write my hexadecimal values using the more modern notation where i would put like a zero x in front of the hexadecimal value like you would see in a c program or any other modern language okay uh the modern uh z80 assemblers all let you do things like that uh, they'll also let you use the H and the end like this if you want to, okay? Uh, this document talks about Z80 assembly in the most traditional form. This is what copyrighted like 1975 or something like that. So um, my point is there are certain things in here that have kind of gone by the wayside that people don't really use much anymore. The... Um, dot mod dot for example is not something anybody would use today you'd use the percent sign to do the modulus division okay you want to shift a value you don't put dot, what is this fortran this is a very fortran ish looking thing so the guys that did this probably i mean you got to realize they designed this chip in the mid mid early 70s right so fortran was still kind of like the language you know c had not come out nor any of its uh you know derivatives uh, at that, well, yeah, it was around, yes, 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 but it wasn't commonly, widely used yet. So this is a uh, very <laughs> Fortran-y looking stuff. Again, nobody uses this anymore. You'd use the double uh, greater than sign to shift it to the right, or a double less than sign to shift something to the left, okay? Um, and then they give you some more examples, and they talk about, here's the use of a label, I can say, I want you to, you know, when the, when I'm executing a program, I get to this here, I want to go to wherever this label is in my code later on. I, we'll, we'll look at some code and we'll see all that later, okay? Uh, it talks about the fact that the dollar sign uh, rep represents here, uh, you know, where this current instruction is actually located. Again, we'll talk about that when we look at some code, how these pseudo operations work. This is a list of things that you can use to tell the assembler about your program, but is not your program itself. Okay, so these are kind of like configuration things. Org, for example, uh, when you write an assembly language program on a modern assembler, you're usually writing it in modules and pieces, and you then use something called a linker to combine them all together, and you then create a map to tell it where you want it all to go. It's not a trivial process, okay? The Z80 programs I'm going to write, I'm not going to use that kind of assembler. I'm going to use a simple one. It reads in one set of source code, it will assemble it, and it will create one executable out of it. In other words, it doesn't have this two-stage process where I'm creating modules and then, as they say, link them all together into an executable program, okay? And in the old days, it was pretty common to do the one big blob approach, okay? And the reason I bring that up is because in the modern days, when you're making many modules and you're, and you're linking them together, you don't generally use the org. 
Okay? In the old days, it's one big wad. The source code was everything. You didn't have this. Okay, take this source and then create a bunch of other configuration information that comes from somewhere else, like the linker, and tell it where you want everything to go when the program runs. So org is used to tell the assembler that the address in memory, where you want the instruction uh, bytes to go, is this value right here. And it needs to know that, as we'll see, in order to uh, generate a, a proper label. It, if it doesn't know where anything is, it can't help you refer to where anything is, okay? Uh, equate allows me to simply assign a numeric like constant to a label. I would call this a, a symbol, but yeah, okay, a label, another kind of label, right? Let's me create a symbolic name, like, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the clock bit in a register. I could give it a name, like reg underscore clock equate, and then I could give it a bi binary or a hex value or a decimal value or whatever, and then I could use then that label in lieu of uh, having to write that number down all the time, okay? So this, yeah, gives you a symbolic name for a, a constant. DEFL, I've never used this in my life. This is basically, looks like it's equivalent to just putting an equate in there. And is uh, useful, especially if you're on the Ed Tasm on a TRS-80. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll save the digression of the week of time that I lost trying to figure out what this thing does, because if you look at the Ed Tasm manual, manual for Model 2, it does not tell you anywhere in that document how to properly use this and what it really does. It is implied, but what is a 14-year-old kid with a paper route <laughs> and no experience? <laughs> how am I supposed to know? Uh, <laughs> News spoiler alert: the uh, it has an operand on on EdTasm that tells it where the um, where the uh, operating system is supposed to start executing your program. By default, it won't run it. It'll put it into memory and then it won't execute it. Very annoying. <laughs> it's your first experience in modern assemblers. This is not all that important. Uh, you can use it, you cannot use it. If it's one big wad, as it says down here, if there isn't one, running into the end of the file is the equivalent, okay? And we don't have to, uh, this problem where we have to tell the operating system where to start our programs because uh, I'm recording this video because we're going to be writing some programs that don't have an operating system. They're called what we, we call a freestanding program or a standalone program. Uh, so we don't have that uh, same problem problem, okay? DEFB, uh, you can also just say DB. This is a defined byte, and you can just put any hex, uh, you know, 8-bit value constant right here, or decimal, or whatever, or like put quotes around it like this. You can create a single character in ASCII, or you can put double quotes around it, I think. Uh, certainly in modern assemblers, you can. As I scroll ahead, it doesn't say that in here. And the assembler we're using, if you put double quotes around um, a multi-character string, it'll just keep on putting many, many uh, characters uh, in one big string. DEFW is a 16-bit value instead of just the 8-bit, so a byte. This is two bytes, right, combined. Now, keep in mind that Z80 is a little Endian machine. So if I say define word or DW uh, is another way to do this, you can say like a hexadecimal uh, one, two, three, four. Okay, what you're really doing on a little Indian machine is asking it to put three, four, and then one, two, in that exact order, in memory. Okay, because it does it, think of it backwards, but it puts the little end first. The least significant byte comes first in memory when you're looking at continuously uh, ascending addresses. Okay, define storage, I can say uh, just do not fill or, you know, just, just reserve waste, consume, whatever word you want to put in there, uh, so many bytes of memory. I, I can also say DS, I believe, and then just say like 32. And that'll just say, uh, do not allocate any values into the following 32 bytes of memory, and then just continue on below. All right. It essentially makes a hole in your program where there's logically nothing, but it'll be uninitialized garbage data, okay? Now, the assembler we're going to use will initialize this data 
because it has to fill it with something in order to consume it, you know, say, you just pad it with something. And you can put a comma and then a padding value in here if you want, all right? And I already showed that in some of my other uh, videos. There's values to uh, assigning, say, for example, a hexadecimal FF while filling in uh, unused memory, because if you're going to put it in a flash, uh, or an EEPROM or something like that, the FF is the natural state of the bytes in those kind of chips, okay? And therefore, the programmer doesn't have to actually program them. It can leave them in their default state. And that is faster to do the programming that way, which is why I do it. And the other reason you might want to do it is it puts less wear on the chip itself. If you're going to reprogram it a lot, you don't want to constantly put zeros in there and then erase it and put one, you know, the erased state it puts it back to ones and so on. If you don't ever put it to zero and you ask it to erase the chip, it's less stress on the, uh, on the device. It lasts longer, in other words. So uh, quite often, if I'm going to create unused memory and I don't care what's in it just to you know fill in space i'll i'll make it all set to ff okay uh what else do we got define uh what is this thing n bytes of i've never used this i'm not going to use it i don't even know what that is uh, we'll move on macros every assembler is different okay the Z80 uh, assembler from 45 years ago uh, may have a different macro language than the modern assemblers do I'm going to use a macro or two in some of the programs that I'm going to write and talk about on my channel here. I'll explain macros at that time, okay, when, when I'm doing one uh, for real, rather than talk about it more figuratively now. If you want to read ahead, knock yourself out. There's a section in this uh, manual that I already saw kind of scroll by when we were uh, getting down to this list of uh, definitions here uh, where they talk about the macro language. Uh, compared to modern processors and modern assemblers, this is nice and primitive, nice and simple. You can uh, go through and kind of figure it out on your own if you are so motivated. And M is the, you, know, you say, you know, macro, I'm beginning a macro, I'm ending a macro. The assembler needs to know where they start and end in order to be able to define and use them. All right, so comments in the assembler that I'm using. What happens is uh, we're gonna anything that ha follows a semicolon. So if I anything you want, even a blank line, you know, if you just hit carriage return, you hit semicolon. Everything that fa follows the semicolon over to the end of the line is a comment. All right, that's all you need to know about that. No, this talks about how the assembler worked 35 years ago, which I can assure you is not the same way the modern assembler works that we're using, so I'm not concerned about that. Uh, it contains upper and lower case. This is going to be assembler specific. I'm not concerned about this either. Um, number bases, again, it'll talk about the hex and the binary and the decimal and how you can follow it with a B for, for binary. Q is usually octal, right? Is that what you have? O uh, or, or Q for octal. O is kind of difficult because you can't tell the difference between that and a zero half the time. So I don't use this. And I never use octal really anyway, so I've never really been a problem. Uh, D uh, is decimal, but it's the default, so I've never used it. In a, again, these are all suffix mode. This is the old school way of doing all this stuff, modern uh, uh, stuff. You still see this. I'll even use it on occasion. But uh, like I said, I like to put 0x in front of my hex constants, okay? Uh, assembler commands themselves. Now, back in the days when we had paper, you would actually write your assembly language code and put eject statements in there that says this has to be the top of a, of a page, you know, because you're kind of thinking of what it's going to look like when you print it out. Because, you know, none of us owned computers back then. We'd have to print it on paper so we could take it to the local, uh, uh, what you would now call Starbucks, I guess, and, and pour through it on paper and make uh, notes in the margins. So th what these things looked like when they were printed out was enormously important back in the day. So there's a bunch of commands in here, none of which we really care about. You know, do you want to see the macros? Do you not want to see the macros? You know, when the compiler runs. Uh, include, this is going to be very useful. We are going to use this to bring in uh, uh, files. Uh, remember, uh, the assembler that we're going to use here, it takes in one source file, assembles it in its entirety, and it's done. 
So if you want to share something between two separate programs, what you do is you create what we call an include file, or some people might think of it as a library or something like that. So when you assemble the one big file, it can include other files into itself. So the assembler still thinks of it as one big file. All right, so you can just catenate together a bunch of, of, of fragments of files and into one big one and let the, uh, the assembler go, all right? Uh, what else do they got in here? Cond. Uh, this is, uh, what we're going to see is if statements, okay? Uh, rather than this, we don't, I, I don't use this uh, notation at all here. The idea is you can put, uh, uh, you know, if uh, I'm, you know, running in debug mode, print a bunch of stuff out here, and then say, and if. So you can have some code in your source code, right? And you assemble it in when you're debugging, and then you just turn off this debug mode. And you can leave all the code there. So, you know, you don't break your program by removing the debug stuff, right? Who has, you know, show of hands, who's never had that happen to you, right? You just leave it in there. And what you do is you shut off this conditional expression to say, don't assemble those lines of code. And we'll see that. I do that all over the place. All right, so I guess I'm wrong. Here's more about macros and stuff like that. Blah, 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 blah. Again, rewind. A lot of stuff that have to do with the old days and punched paper tape and printouts and stuff like that, none of which we care about. Then we get to another section that talks about the CPU, and this is kind of important. We want to understand the CPU as a whole. Uh, the way the Z80 works, it's it's a you know early what we would call KISC machine or a CISC machine, complex instruction set. Okay, The idea is that you can perform an operation, and then after the operation is done, you can ask, what happened during that operation? Like, did I add two values together and get a zero? Okay, when that happens, we have this thing over here called the Z flag or the zero flag that turns on and it says, hey, the last ALU operation resulted in the value equal to zero. So you can then later on use that to direct your conditional branching. So you can say things like add A and B together, the two registers, right? And uh, then you can say jump to some other place in your program. If the zero flag is set, or you can also say if it's not set, if it's not zero, go somewhere else and do something else. Otherwise, you know, the opposite is true, fall down and continue executing. And there's a bunch of different things you can ask about. Did I add two things together and get a carry? Was there a carry coming out of that? In other words, was the result too big to fit into one register? Okay. And there's, uh, you know, other variations of this whole thing. Um, Sign is the value uh, that came out of the last arithmetic operation, negative or positive, things like that, okay? And read all about them down here. And examples, if you do this, there'll be a carry or there'll be a borrow, okay? Lots of details on this, okay? Then we get to the instructions themselves. And this is the beginning of where a lot of people start uh, talking about assembly language, okay? Uh, this is, I, I'm going to let them handle it uh, when, when it comes to just, you know, it, you know <laughs> reading 200 pages of instruction after instruction. I'm not going to do that. We're going to look at one or two so that you can get used to how this document was designed. And then you can run with this to your heart's content, okay? Um, Notice these are group, 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 group. So what happened is Zilog partitioned each of the uh, different instructions into different sets, okay? So the idea, the 8-bit load group, for example, are a bunch of instructions. They're all going to be called load, and as are these, okay? Um, the 8-bit load group are all the instructions that have to do with moving around 8-bit values. Not a bad name for those instructions. And these are the all the load instructions that have to do with moving around 16-bit values, okay? The exchange block transfer and search group. This group includes instructions, if you watch my channel, like the LDIR instruction, one of my favorites, right? LDIR stands for load, increment, and repeat. That is definitely a CISC instruction. No risk machine anywhere will do anything like that. That involves three register pairs and an instruction that continuously runs for <laughs> up to 64,000 times, you know, a variable length of execution, in other words, that sort of thing. 
the search is very similar to the LDIR, but rather than copying things from one place to another in memory, what it'll do is it'll go through all these uh, bytes of memory and it'll stop when it finds something that you've asked it to locate. The exchange has to do with uh, the fact that the Z80 actually has two sets of registers, and you can exchange them, you can flip them, all right? you can swap them. The idea is that's a, a quick way to save something, and then you swap them again and you get them back. You can do this, it all stays inside the CPU. You don't have to copy them out into memory to save them and then copy them back when you're done to restore them, okay? Uh, and that's a very simple example. There's some creative ways to use this as well. Uh, we'll uh, get there soon enough when we talk about... I use this in some of the programs that, that, that we'll look at down the road. It'll become more clear with, with, with examples, okay? Now there's the 8-bit arithmetic and logic group. This is the instructions, as I mentioned earlier, the A, the accumulator, this A register has a special purpose, okay? It in, is involved in all of the 8-bit arithmetic instructions. The accumulator is where the results of any arithmetic operation goes, or logical. If it goes through the 8-bit ALU inside the CPU, it involves the accumulator. That's the role of that. It's special purpose, super, that's the Uber register. That gets you, you can, that's the most flexible register in the machine, okay? The general purpose CPU and control groups, we're going to see this as a bunch of instructions. Like, I don't know, well, that's not branching. What is a control group? Heck, I'm going to actually have to look that up and re be reminded of which one of the instructions are uh, are in there. Uh, general purpose. Uh, oh, you know what these are? I think these are things like you can, uh, in a single instruction, you can say things like clear the carry bit and stuff like that. Okay. We'll see if I'm right. When we get down, we'll, we'll take a quick eyeball down there and see. 16-bit arithmetic group, okay? Notice that there is an 8-bit arithmetic and logical group, and there's a 16-bit arithmetic group. In other words, there's no logic involved in the 16-bit operations. These are uh, a reduced set of operations that you can do. Pretty much this is only adding and subtracting is what you can do uh, on in 18-bit groups, and even then only on certain registers and certain situations, all right? So these are very much not general purpose 16-bit type operations. This one up here, the 8-bit uh, stuff is far more general purpose, okay? As you will see, the rotating and shifting, to me, that's kind of still in the, in the arithmetic and logic group. But they decided, uh, let's go ahead and, <laughs> and put them in its old group. Uh, bit set, reset, and test. These instructions all have to do with, you know, I have a value in a register and I want one of the bits to be turned on or I want this bit to be turned off, okay? Or I want to ask a question. Is, you know, the third bit a one or a zero in, in you know, in some register, all right? Jump. I have alluded to that earlier. This is just, you know, you're executing one instruction after another, boom, 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 boom. Uh, and eventually you decide, hey, I want to go back up and do that again. So you, you, you jump from, you know, an instruction down here that says jump back up to the top like of a loop and then do everything again. All right. Call and return, that's for calling subroutines and then returning back to the caller. Input and output, that's for uh, writing values to uh, devices and reading uh, values in, okay? This is uh, dealing with I.O. devices in stark contrast to dealing with the memory, okay? And then they got this index down here, okay? So this is really why I wanted to show you this manual, okay? This is the... The, the I swear, everyone just cut and pasted this into their uh, 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 manuals back in the day. So this is like the original version. And I want you to see the original one, the ugly one, in its, you know, all of its glory specifically because Zilog themselves apparently lost the source code to this document and they OCR'd this whole thing. Clearly they did. We'll look at the modern version of this exact same manual in a minute. And what happens is, when you look down here, the modern one, this down here, did not OCR correctly. So here's the modern version of the same manual. All right? Notice it says R, C right here. They got the R primes rhyme 
right over here, okay? But they didn't get it right over here. And there are a lot of little things in this modern version of this manual where this is the case, all right? I've been kind of poking fun at this all along on my channel, but my, my point is be careful, all right? You might really want to go grab the old ugly ones. In fact, if, if memory serves, look very closely at this wording in this sentence right here, and then look very closely at the same sentence up here. Let's see what's going on here. The contents of any register R prime are loaded to any other register R. Contents of any register R prime are loaded into any other register R. All right, this one makes a little more sense, okay? And, and it goes on and on and on and on. Uh, little, little things here and there, okay? And, and they could throw you if you're very new, like I was. And like I said, I'm hypersensitive to this after wasting a week of frustration figuring out that I had to put an address after the end statement on the Edesm assembler. Okay, so uh, how do you read this? What do you do with this thing, all right? First of all, start with the old one so it doesn't have any typos. Uh, second of all, what we're looking at is kind of like the template, uh, how, how the instruction is supposed to look. You use LD, that's the opcode. That's the mnemonic we say for the instruction. Then you have R, comma, R prime. Now be careful. The, the, I don't know why they use this notation. Obviously, they did it from day one, which is very annoying because uh, specifically... The exchange instructions we mentioned a few minutes ago refer very specifically to registers, and the two registers are formally referred to as, like, for example, A and A prime. And in that context, A prime has nothing whatsoever to do with this load instruction right here. Okay, I am just disgusted that they decided to do this notation in here. I don't, I don't know what they were thinking. Okay, maybe they, they had a new guy that day, and they, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, this R comma, I would have said R comma R. Okay, now the reason they put prime in here is to let you know that <laughs> if I said R comma R, <laughs> and you know somebody who's super sensitive like myself might laugh and say, oh, it only it suggests that you can only copy from one register into itself, right? So they really wanted to punch the fact that you got register one and register two uh, don't need to be the same register, okay? But be careful because that little prime right there has nothing whatsoever to do with A prime and B prime and C prime and D prime and E prime and H prime and L prime. Those are actual registers that have nothing to do with this instruction, okay? This is the only idiosyncrasy where I'm aware of that they have abused this prime uh, uh the prime directive right <laughs> this prime notation uh in a way that i thought was a really poor choice okay all right so what is the point uh the manual here says here's what the operation op code the mnemonic looks like and the operands are two registers okay somewhere in here it says every time in this manual when i say r i'm referring to any one of these registers and if i wanted to encode that in binary, this load instruction looks like this. In binary, you'll see a 0, 1, followed by a 3-bit value that represents the destination register, followed by a 3-bit value that represents the source register. So, as you can see, this, uh, what we call opcode pressure, this thing consumes an enormous amount of uh, possible one-byte values that represents, you know, out of all the operations that this machine could ever do, most of them is this load instruction here, okay? When I teach assembly language in college, I, 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 I note to the students, I say, you know, it's funny, because if you think about all the instructions a machine does, and we just kind of looked at these groups a minute ago, and what we'll, in a minute we'll look at the table of all the instructions in kind of like a condensed view. Uh, I ask them to take a step back and think about this for a second. What does a machine really do? Look at how many different instructions. How, what are the total number of combinations of instructions? 64 out of 256 total opcodes this, this machine has. A quarter of the entire set of all the operations uh, do nothing at all other than make a copy of something. That's all this is going to do. 
So anyway, so that's how you read this. Each instruction, one at a time, they go through all this stuff. They show you how it's encoded in binary, and they give you the list of all the possibilities. This thing will take one M cycle to execute which consumes four T states. And watch my channel, you know that uh, M1 has uh, four T states, so that shouldn't come as no shock. And it, when it's done, it'll immediately start executing the following instruction. This over here has to do with, if you're running on a four megahertz Z80, it'll take what, one uh, microsecond? Millisecond? I don't know. The execution time is in, in I don't remember what units I'd have to... For, uh, yeah, 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 it would be one microsecond, okay? Four megahertz, four T states. <laughs> I think I can do that division in my head and <laughs> get one microsecond out of it, uh, which is really kind of irrelevant because today uh, most Z80s run faster than four megahertz. Uh, and then they give you an example and they describe, hey, you know, if one register has this value and, you know, if H currently contains eight A and E contains one zero and you do this, the result will be that both registers after completion of this will contain one zero. You can't not understand this instruction. OK, like I said, a lot of people that I knew that are about my age and I said, well, when, when you learned, uh, you know, started learning, you know, assembly language programming or, or just programming in general, what was your first experiences? And we all had very similar ones. And I always got a kick out of it when people said, you know, the Ed Taz manual was great. And what they were really talking about was this manual here that was copied into Ed Taz was the, uh, the, the, the great thing. Why? Because even a kid. Like I said, who rides his bike to Radio Shack to buy resistors and pays for them with a paper route can read this thing and understand what's going on. All right. This is why I'm not going to read you the whole manual. Get this, know it, love it. Okay. If you need a long form discussion, here it is. You get 200 pages of this. Okay. Now let's look at another uh, tabular version of this same information. So now I'm going to go back to the uh, Z80 uh, family who had a product specifications handbook. I've shown this on my channel before. This is from 1984. So, oh, this is much newer. Okay. Now I'm going back to 1984 for a really specific reason. I can get, I can show you, I'll include a link to a much cleaner, prettier version of this that's in like a doc uh, format. Somebody went through and painstakingly retyped it all in because when we look at it in here, it'll be all scanned in and kind of blurry. And, you know, it's just not beautiful okay you can get a nicer version however the modern one people have noticed i mean this cpu now is what 45 years old okay introduced in 1975 for like 200 dollars a piece oh, yeah. and those are 1975 dollars might as well be a thousand uh the amount of time that has passed people have noticed things you know, what happens when you execute opcodes that are not really assigned anything? What if you do things that, that, that are not documented? You know, what, how, does it, how does the machine react? And they've charted all this information, okay? My point is, if you get this, you know, modern version that somebody recreated, it includes all this additional stuff. And I generally try to shy away from things like that. You know, I don't like to overclock my Raspberry Pi and exceed the thermal envelope and things. <laughs> I say all this while overclocking the, the flash chip on this on my retro board, right? Okay, fine. I'll hang my head in shame. But <laughs> as a general rule, I try to avoid that, okay? So there are more things that the chip can do if you want to... Uh, uh, you tell it, you know, give it machine instructions, opcodes, and bytes that are not documented in this manual, all right? So uh, this manual is the official specification, and the other one is an observation of, yes, it'll do everything in this book and more if you know how, okay? So I'll put links to both of them. Uh, the newer one, like I said, is much easier, much more pr pretty, beautiful to read. Uh, but let's look at the first one here to get our uh, our bearings here. So what this is is a book that describes the various chips, the CPU, the DMA controller, and so on. Um, uh, where are we at here? We need to find the, the instruction set summary. I don't know. It's around page 20 or 30 or something like that. Here's... Uh, you've seen some of these diagrams in my uh, retro board series already. So uh, this is a nice diagram of all the registers. 
And in the next page or two is where this big table is we're going to look at in a second, all right? So let's zoom in on this and have a look-see here. Uh, remember when I said there's an A and an A prime and a B and a B prime and a C and a C prime and so on, right? That's what's being shown in this table here. The main registers are here. The alternate registers are over here. And what we'll see is there's an instruction that says exchange all six of these registers with all six of these registers over here, okay? Basically swap them. The instruction is actually exchange, okay? And the again, I mentioned it before. If I want to write a subroutine and I want to, and I need a bunch of registers, and I want it to go really fast, and you know, by convention, you have to make sure when you write a program, you have to agree on when you can modify what registers. Unless you know, if you're not allowed to modify it, you have to save it, and then you can alter it, and then you can restore it, and so on. And it's a very widely used convention that uh, at any time you can use the prime registers, but you're not, you know, without having to save and reload them and stuff like that. But you uh, are not allowed to uh, alter and destroy the contents of, say, the, the, the non-prime versions, okay? That is one thing you could do as a convention in a machine design, okay? And the idea is if, if, if that is what you've done, and, and honestly, uh, you can't. You, you'll see that used in like an interrupt handler or something like that. It'll they'll take it to the extreme where they say no one's ever allowed to use the prime registers for anything whatsoever unless you're writing code that runs in an interrupt handler. Because the interrupt handler then convention will be exchange all these, do anything it wants, exchange them back again, and then return. The point is, it's much faster. Then, if you have to copy all these registers out into the memory, do what you're going to do, reload them all back in, and then return from an interrupt handler. Right? The argument is you need to have your interrupt handlers run as short a, a period of time as possible. So that's one way you can use these. All right? Again, whatever your design, do anything you want. Point is, you can swap these whenever you want. Uh, independently, you can also swap A to F with A prime and F prime. All right, so you can this top pair with this top pair, and you can do these six here with these six there. All right. Uh, in addition to these uh, general purpose registers here, you've got, I mentioned before, the accumulator, a very special, the high and mighty exalted accumulator. This is the most uh, important register in the machine. These are just general purpose registers. HL, as I alluded to earlier, has uh, some special purposes, uh, but uh, is not as um, special, I should say, as the accumulator. The F register, I've never really thought of this as a register, but it, it, you can treat it as if it is one in a couple of very specific instructions. This is an incredibly not general purpose register as one way to think of it, right? As I mentioned before, the flags, the flag register holds these, these, these condition bits, the zero flag, the carry, things like that, all right? This is where the ALU reports uh, what happens happened in, a, in the most recent operation, okay? And again, you can save it by swapping it with the alternates. Uh, there are no alternates for the registers down here, and there are the index X, index Y register. These are general-ish purpose registers, but they are only used in, well, actually, <laughs> there are undocumented instructions that allow you to use these in weird ways, but as designed and as intended, these are supposed to be used as 16-bit registers, okay? And you can do things like uh, load an address into the IX register, and then ask the CPU to load, say, for example, into the B register. Set, I want to load B, comma, and then I can say, uh, I want to load into the B register the value that's in memory at the address in the index register here, IX. Or I can say, uh, from the value in the IX register plus, you know, uh, eight bytes or something. So these are indexes, usually, like another kind of pointer register that includes the ability to add a numeric uh, offset. If you think about it, if you know how to program in C, if you have a structure, what you could do is point IX or IY at the first byte in a struct. And then you might say, I want to load uh, into the C register uh, the value in memory uh, four bytes into that struct. 
So if you have a struct of a bunch of 8-bit integers, you point the index at the first byte, and then all these other values that are in that struct, you can refer to them based on the offset from the beginning of the struct. And that's roughly uh, one uh, general use of the index registers. Stack pointer is used for the machine stack pointer. I got a video on stacks uh, of this kind. There's different kinds of stacks. I have a video where I talk about machine stacks, and I'll put a link to that in the description below this video if you don't know what a stack is uh, in this context. The idea is it's it's used to keep track of where uh, you store things. You use an operation called push and pop to put things into the stack and take them back out. And almost all microprocessors have these things, okay? Uh, and if they don't have a dedicated stack pointer, they have instructions that allow you to use things like a general purpose register as if it was a stack pointer, okay? Program counter, very special purpose register that just keeps track of the current instruction location in the memory where the CPU is currently executing. Interrupt vector, very special purpose. Uh, we'll talk about that when we talk about uh, interrupts in general and uh, I.O. devices that generate them. Uh, the R register, I've never used it. It is uh, supposed to be used, or originally intended uh, to be used to uh, count freely during the machine one cycle. If you watch my channel, uh, when you look at the M1 cycle, part of it includes a uh, pulse uh, that tells your dynamic RAM, if you have dynamic RAM, DRAM in your design, when it is a good time to refresh and what address it should be refreshing at any given point in time is the value that's in this R register. You can set it and read it and things like that, but I never use it. I'd love to hear in the comments, has anybody used this for anything other than DRAM refresh? That'd be kind of cool. Uh, it's a counter. I suppose you could use it for something, but uh, I, meh, I've never used it. These registers over here have to do with enabling and disabling the interrupts. What happens when you have a non-maskable interrupt versus a maskable interrupt? How do you restore them? Uh, you know, once they're disabled and then re-enabled, and which mode of interrupts are you in? Uh, the uh, modes have to do with the compatibility to the 8080. Interrupt mode number zero, for example, tells the Z80, which is the default mode, by the way, after a reset, to operate and emulate the exact same uh, behavior that you get on an 8080 chip. It's part of the compatibility stuff. Interrupt mode number one and number two are advanced modes where the Z80 can do fancier stuff than you could get out of the older Z80 stuff. Okay? So this is the registers. If you, Again, if you don't really know what registers are, these are variables. Uh, the, the, the equivalent role of a variable in a regular, you know, higher level program, but an assembler, this is what your, your variables are called, and these are the only ones you can have. You can't just start inventing new ones. The instructions in the machine, we just saw one. That 8-bit load exists for no other reason than to copy uh, values between A, B, C, D, H, uh, A, B, C, D, E, H, and L amongst each other. You can't even use it to transfer the flag register. You can't use it to access these down here either. Okay, let's go back. A, B, C, D, E, H, L. So that means what, right? Notice there's no index registers or anything else in here. There's only uh, so many bits. But, you know, this is actually the load with, with N, but it doesn't matter. It's the same up here as well. If I got copied between two registers, the uh, only values you can use are these, all right? So again, we have a limited amount of activity that we can do because they're trying to save silicon, save power, and save you, the consumer, money, all right? Plus, it might have been even too complicated for them to do at the time. Like I said, the introductory price of this was $200. How much, how much more would you be willing to pay if you could copy the index Y high-order byte into the B register? You know, is it really worth that much? I'm going to go with a new. And, and by the way, the undocumented instructions do kind of let you do that sort of thing if you really want to, okay? I'll leave that as a test the viewer to pursue that later. Now, the next page of the manual uh, gives you more of a formal description of what each one of these are, all right? So they name them here, and they show you in these in this block diagrams here to kind of suggest how they're grouped and logically how you think about them, all right? They're different groups, different purposes. And then they tell you what they all are used for, okay? 
uh, how many bits are in each one and stuff like that, okay? And I already explained all that fun stuff. This describes the interrupt modes, how they're, uh, like, you know, compatible with the 8080 and stuff like that. Get the font right so we can see it on the screen here, okay? Uh, yeah, mode 1, 8080, blah, 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 okay? If you want to know more, read all about that. And then down here, what does he talk about? A lot of description about interrupts and the chains. I talked about this when we were doing uh, board testing videos with the CTC and generating interrupts and stuff like that, okay? Now, we get back into the instruction set. So this is a condensed view of what we just saw with the, uh, whatever, the 1975 manual that somebody paid $7.50 for, Okay. Again, we got 8-bit load, 16-bit load, exchange block transfer. It's same information with a different presentation. And this is the point that I want you all to walk away with. This is what I want to close with. You want to know how to use this table. Okay? Do I need to teach you assembler? The answer is no. Do you need to learn it? Uh, well, just learn how to use this table here. Okay? Now, let me zoom in a little bit. Now, we already looked at the load. R comma R prime. Again, at least they're consistent in their inconsistent use of the prime here, okay? What does this thing say? R left arrow R prime. This is what we call like RTL notation, register transfer logic, okay? This is the mnemonic load space R comma R, you know, two different register names. It does this. You'll see that's the same thing that it said over here, okay? I'm wasting an entire page for one instruction here. We're only going to waste, you know, <laughs> a quarter of an inch if you print this on actual paper. So it says R is loaded with R prime. These dots here mean that these individual flags are in no way changed as a result of this operation. Now, you'll see most of the loads don't have anything to do with ever changing the flags. Until you get down here, these are really special uh, instructions. As you can see, uh, if I say load the accumulator with the contents of the interrupt uh, vector register, it can change these two flags. Uh, X, uh, if you go back and look at the detail of the flags register in the older manual, or even look around in this manual, it'll tell you these two bits are, are not part of there there are only so many flags there's only six flags there's not eight so these x's represent a position in the so-called flag register that won't have useful values let's just say they're indeterminate they're probably zeros or something like that okay so what do we got here if i say load a with i it's an i not a one it says these two uh can change value whether the s and z based on uh, whatever criteria we'd have to look in the more detailed description of this instruction sometimes there's notes over here that's why i scrolled over to look over there th that might describe this uh that doesn't exist this will always be set to zero okay scroll back up the h flag will always be set to zero after this is done for whatever reason the iff latch value will be stored in this flag the pv flag Okay, this will always be set to zero, which is the negative flag. You know, when you're asking, is the value negative? It'll always say no. And this flag over here, which I think is the carry flag, will always be left unchanged, right? So that's how you read this column here. If you want to know what's changing in here, well, you can go back to the uh, original manual here or even the more modern one. The, the, the good news about the modern one is, by the way, that uh, they made this one work more like a regular PDF. So if you scroll to the uh, up and top here, and you can see all these things, this is now clickable. The other one, you, the, the, the old one, you have to look forever to find everything. So here is your load A comma I. I can click on it, and you can then read about it in here, and this will tell you exactly why it changes those flags. Okay, so this is why you you, you want to be able to read. You know, you want to be aware of both of these manuals. But once you use an instruction, you kind of know how it works. You might forget the uh, the value of this is it's your reminder. A mainframe programmer would call this their green card. Okay, it's the summary of all the instructions, and it tells you how they're encoded. This instruction, for example, is ED followed by fifty seven. This one requires two bytes. For the uh, machine 
uh, uh, to uh, represent this one instruction. You hardly ever do it, if ever. So it's okay for this to be big and wasteful and slow, is the thinking there. Okay. It's also not present on the 8080 processor, so it doesn't have a single byte opcode that like the 8080 would have used. All the instructions that start with ED are Z80 specific special extended purpose kind of instructions. The ED, you also see a DD followed by a 36 here. All the index instructions, there were no index registers in the 8080, so these two are extended. DD, FD, ED, and I think there's a CD or something like that that's also in this set of extended op codes. You'll see those as you look around in here, okay? So what do we got going on here? We can what? Load one register with another register value. You can load a register with some numeric value N. We also looked at that instruction in the, in the old uh, page per uh, operation uh, document. Look closely over here how they represent that. It says the uh, most significant two bits of this instruction is 0, 0. And then the three bits right here hold the three-bit number that represents which register it wants to store it into, okay? And then the value over here, the lowest three bits, must be a 110, okay? Now, this right here, hiding underneath here, says that this first byte, which is the opcode, which means load uh, immediate, we say, load a register R, whatever that one, whatever the three-bit code represents there, with the one-byte value, that will follow this opcode in memory, okay? Now, if you look over in the margin over here, there's a little hiding over here, and it says, look, for the registers that involve an R and or an R prime, these are the bit values. It's the same numbers that we saw in this manual here, all right? Now, they listed them in alphabetical order here, A being triple one, B being triple zero, and so on. And this one over here, they're in numeric order. All right, get over it. <laughs> okay, uh, same values though. All right, so that's how you read this table And once you get going on. Uh, most of these instructions, I would argue, are really obvious. You just need to remember, well, uh, how do I do this? Which one's on the left? Was it the destination or the source where you can see R and R prime? Well, R prime with the little arrow there is pointing to the left. So this reminds you that R is the destination when it makes the copy. Okay? N gets put into R. What is this? Okay? When you put something in parentheses in Z80 assembly language, what you're doing is you're performing an indirection. If you're writing a C program and you have a pointer variable, you stick a star in front of it, that says, go get the thing out of memory that my pointer variable is pointing at. In Z80 assembly, the HL register is an incredibly common thing to use as a pointer. And the value of HL would be an instruction where you would just simply say HL. You put parentheses around it, you're saying, I want to uh, uh, dereference that pointer. I want to go through this indirection process. I want to go to into memory at the address that is in the HL register pair, go and get the value out of memory, and then store it into whatever register R is, okay? And the way that is encoded is over here. It's part of these 01 jobbies, destination register, and then you say 110 over here. So presumably, if you look over here, there is no 110 in this list of possible values. Okay, we have a three bit value and you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven possible register values. Three bit value can have eight total combinations. So the unused one is what they used for this instruction here. All right. So uh, if you look up an 8080 assembly language manual, there's a special, they use a different way of referring to this HL in parentheses. They have this fake register, this pseudo register. They call it M. So in that documentation, I suspect that they don't actually single this out. They probably consider it no different than this one up here. And if they were going to use this notation, they would have list listed the M register in this set of, of values. 
as 110, as if it were a regular old register. And I want to really drive this point home because I'm going to do some CPM programming. And at times when you go, if you download stuff on the net and it's written in 8080 assembler, you may see references to some register called M. In Z80, it is HL with parentheses around it. Okay. Now, the Z80 has the extra index registers here that the 8080 does not have. And they want to use the same convention. So if I go to I, I, the value in IX register, okay, the, the number in there, I want to use it as an address, a pointer. I can add a numeric value, D, to the contents of the index X register. The parentheses then again say go out into memory at that address that you calculated. Grab a byte and stick it in the R register. And then you go over here. Here's how it's encoded. This is one of these extra fancy instructions. It starts with a DD followed by the 01, follow, you know, with whatever three bit number comes from this table to store it into the R register. Followed by that. And then the D value, a one byte D value to, that it's going to add to the index register when it's calculating the address. Okay. Now, I think you can figure all the rest of these out. Ooh, tricky. Look, reverse them. Take a num numeric value and put it into memory. <laughs> you know what I mean? So these are going the other way around. Uh, put something into a register, uh, copy between registers, I should say, up here. This is put a numeric value into a register. Single N means eight bits in their notation. Go get stuff out of memory, put it into a register. This is take a register, put it into memory using different techniques, okay? Uh, take a 8-bit uh, immediate uh, numeric value and stick it into memory using a couple of different techniques, okay? Now, we can also use B, C, D, E and an, a an actual uh, numeric value in parentheses. Just like the HL above, I can say, go into memory at the address in the B, C register pair, go get the byte out of there, and store that into the accumulator. Notice it says A here. It does not say R. This is limited, okay? That's why I said the A is the high and mighty, exalted, super duper, uber important register. Why? Because a lot of instructions that could be really useful to you <laughs> will only let you store something in the accumulator. I could not st go into memory and get it using the BC as a pointer and then store it into the L register or something like that. Okay, no, that's not allowed. I can even go into memory at a 16-bit immediate value. Look at how this one's encoded over here. If I said 3A, then following two bytes could represent a 16-bit value that is an address in memory. It says just go over to that hard-coded absolute address right there that's right in here as part of the instruction itself. Go get the byte out of there. Stick it into the accumulator, please. All right? And we use this every now and then. I do in, in, uh, in special cases in my code, right? If I'm directly access various uh, uh, values and things. Is there any notes over here about this? No. Uh, and again, these comments with all these numbers over here tell you how many machine cycles it takes to do these things. Okay. How many bytes long is the instruction? How many M cycles are there? And how many T states? Remember, the M1 cycle has four T states, and the other M cycles have three. So if you go down here to this uh, big long one here, uh, where is the, okay, load uh, the accumulator from memory with an absolute address, this guy right there, and we say 3A followed by blah, blah, it has four uh, M say, cycles, okay? which is 13 T states. Is that right? Three, four, I gotta remember what it is. Oh, number of bytes, M's like, okay, fine, right, right. Of course, it's a three byte instruction because there's your, uh, uh, where is the one? Uh, this one up here. Turns out it's the same anyway. Uh, it has three bytes, it's the opcode followed by the operand, which is the address here. It has four M cycles, so the first one will be four, and the other one will be three, three, three. 3 times 3 is uh, 9, plus 4 is 13, okay? So it takes 13 clock ticks. And if you're running at 1 megahertz clock, that would be 13 microseconds. If you're running at 10 megahertz, obviously 1.3. Okay, so that's how you read this table, certainly for the 8-bit instructions. 
you know, you really, I mean, at this point, you've got a real good leg up, and you can just start going nuts here. Here, oh, here are the 16-bit ones. Okay, this is rocket science at this point, right? How hard can it be? Look what's going on. This one says, low DD, comma, NN. Using their notation, DD, there's the destination, and N is the source, and in this convention is always a numeric value. DD will be registers. So it says, okay, here's the two bit value that goes in here where the Ds are. If you want to load into B, C, D, E, H, L, or SP using this particular instruction right here, those are the two bits that go here, okay? And NN is an immediate operand, as we say, a 16-bit hexadecimal or what, a 16-bit binary value that's stored right in the instruction itself. You can do the same thing to load a value into the IX register because this is a Z80 specific thing. It has a special starting DD value. The FD value is. You'll notice a, con, uh, a convention here. All the index X instructions start with a DD. All the index Ys start with an FD, and so on. All right. Uh, what else do we got here? Load. Uh, look what's happening here. Go take a 16-bit number, treat it as an address, right, with the parentheses. So go out into memory and go grab two bytes out of memory and store those two bytes in the HL register. See how the RTL works over here? H says go to the byte in memory at address NN plus 1. Remember I said little endian. There, these are in little endian order in the instructions themselves. When the machine goes out into memory and says, oh, I want to go get a, ma a value out of there. Well, if it's not an 8-bit value, you have to decide which one goes first. Well, the first one goes in the second address. Uh, the, you're right, and you write the first byte here at the address that you gave it goes into the L register. The second byte, I, I wish they would have reversed this. It would have made more sense to say, <laughs> take the first one and put it in L, take the second one and put it in H, all right? If you look at it in hex dump in memory, it'll be backwards, so to speak, okay? So what else do you got? You can say, uh, what else? You can load, uh, this one loads into HL. Notice, that, and then it says, it's kind of like, you might argue, why why do we have the same thing? If I can say, go into memory at NN and put it in HL, why didn't they just not say this? Because I can go into memory uh, at address NN and store it in a DD. Well, it turns out, look what's happening over here, how it's encoded. Look at how long it takes to do this instruction versus this one up here. This first one is an 8080 instruction. It's simply 2A followed by 16 bits. This one here is more general purpose. The 8080, you can't go out into memory at some immediate address and grab something and store it into the BC register. They don't have an instruction for that. The Z80 does, but it's extended. Okay, so there's an extra byte here. It takes longer to do it, but you can. Okay, so again, you look over here in the, the DD pair. In fact, if you really wanted to, you could waste time by loading HL uh, with a value uh, in memory at this absolute address. And you can use this instruction to do that if you wanted to, but it would waste time, okay? You're better off using the old instruction here that runs in less time, all right? So again, this is kind of what you want to keep in mind, in my opinion. Once you get your basics down, you want to, like I said, you want to keep in mind the fact that this is a an 8080 language machine plus extensions and keep your eye on where your time is being wasted when you're using the fancier instructions down here okay if this is all over your head don't worry just go back and find some basic tutorial and then come back here for the this maybe is a little more advanced stuff but to me this is the the big picture that i could provide over uh, the basic uh, how to how to add two numbers together kind of uh tutorial all right so you can also store things back into memory and you can do special things involving the stack pointer and copying values out of registers into the stack pointer and so on. Okay. Uh, what else we got? We got pushing and popping. These let you put things into the stack, take things out of the stack. There's special instructions for the fancy Z80s with these extended op codes. And then there's regular push and pop that have shorter instruction lengths where there's a single byte op code. Okay. These here let you push and pop the normal register pairs, which I'll you know, those are the, the, the B, C, D, E, H, L register pairs. And in this case, when you push A, F, for example, 
This is where F, the flags act like a register. Because you can save the current state of all the flags if you want to. When you push the A register and the F register together into memory to save it, you can also pop them back out down here. Okay? Now the Z80 has, you know, because the 8080 didn't have these index registers, you have to use the extended AD80 instruction mnemonics with the extra bytes if you want to push and pop those other registers. Okay? Here's your block exchange transfer stuff. Remember our friend LDIR. LDI, by the way, is the exact same thing, except it does not repeat. Okay? It's obviously, you build the hardware to do LDIR. It's easy to do LDIR. Just stop before you ask, should I go back and do it again? All right? Uh, the implication, by the way, of LDIR and it doesn't really say this in here. I don't think that even the long-form description tells you something about the LDIR that you probably should know. Let's go grab the modern ones because I can click on it. And if there's typos, maybe I'll notice. And we can double-check if we need to. Exchange, LDI, LDIR. The key here has to do with interrupt handling. Think about how long it takes this instruction to run. Let's say I want to copy 32K of memory. That's a long time. All right? Let's look at this again. What does it do? It takes a byte out of memory at the address in the HL register. And then it stores it back into memory at the address that's in the DE register. When that's done, it adds one to the DE register and stores it back in DE. Adds one to HL, stores it back in HL. Add one to BC, stores it back in B, or subtract one, I should say. Store it back in BC. And then it asks, is BC equal zero? If the answer to that is no, it goes back up here and does all this again. Again and again and again and again until BC, the register pair BC equals zero. Then it falls through to execute the, the instruction that follows, okay? So let's look again at this uh, newer version of the long form here. It should say in here somewhere, aha, right here, that when this instruction is running, how does it repeat it? What does it really do? Look at this description right down in here. It, okay, so it, it basically it goes through what I just said. You know, do this, increment HL, increment DC, decrement the BC register. If decrementing allows the BC to go to zero, the instruction is terminated. It is done. On the other hand, if BC is not zero, how does it repeat this instruction? What does it do? It actually decrements the program counter by two. And then I would argue the instruction is terminated. Think about what that means, right? What will happen is, to repeat the instruction, it'll actually go back and refetch it again. <laughs> okay? And in refetching it, uh, what will happen is, there will be a refresh cycle and stuff like that. All right? Because you can't just tie up your CPU for, I mean, if you move all 64K, right? Right? Uh, it could take, I don't know, a quarter or a half a second, even at 10 megahertz. You can't ignore DRAM refresh that long. It'll all reset and forget. Okay, you also don't want to lock out all your interrupts. Remember, interrupts can only happen, uh, are only recognized at the end of the execution of an instruction. So what happens is LDIR repeats itself by simply subtracting a value from the program counter so that the next instruction that will be fetched is just the LDI or all over again. Okay? Now, oh, I may be lying a little bit. I don't know if it actually physically refreshes the, uh, the, um, the opcode. It might. <laughs> it wouldn't shock me. Why? Because actually, I'll bet it does. We should put a scope on and watch it go. Uh, I've probably done that at one point, but forgot. Notice it says uh, interrupts are recognized, and it says two refresh cycles are executed after each data transfer. It doesn't really say how. How does it do that? Look what's going on here. It has an EDB0. It is a two-byte instruction. 
When it fetches those two bytes, it probably does two M1 cycles, and an M1 cycle includes a refresh. That's probably why it does two refreshes uh, between each data transfer, okay? And because it actually, you know, it's, the instruction itself ends and kind of starts back up again, then there is a, a point of time when an interrupt can be recognized and processed and when the interrupt returns, it can return right back into uh, continuing the execution of the LDIR instruction. All right? That's kind of a think about it. You know, you would like that feature, and that's that's how it's going to be done. Okay? Because it, this is just a simple trick. It's LDI followed by oh yeah, move the program counter back so that when 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 the next instruction is fetched, it just simply fetches the same one all over again. All right? Uh, LDI simply does it once and does not repeat. Uh, here's your exchanges, okay? Uh, these here don't involve the prime registers, as you can see up here. Exchange here, take the value that's in HL and swap it with whatever is at the top of the stack. That's what that means, okay? Swap IX, top of stack, swap YI with, uh, with the top of the stack. Here's the EXX, which says swap all the BC with BC prime, DE, DE prime. This is the thing I was talking about earlier the prime regs and the regular regs. Here's AF with AF prime, okay? Notice there's not an exchange that does all the B, C, D, E, H, L, and AF in one. There's not a Uber exchange, okay? There's one exchange, EXX, which exchanges these three register pairs. If you wanted to do all the registers, you'd have to then also do EXAF with AF prime to get them all done, if you really want to. Uh, this instruction up here is um, allows you to swap the contents of the HL register with the DE register. All right, that's probably an 8080 instruction. I suspect it is. Okay, uh, so there's your, you know, these guys and so on. What do we got here? Block transfer inserts continuing. Uh, this one is uh, LDIR, but going backwards. Unless we subtract all of them. All right. The reason you need forward and backward is so you can do a non-destructive copy. You can copy something over itself. And it's important to get the order right if you want to not destroy the contents, right? I think I wrote a, uh, a program where I use LDIR and I created what we call a destructive copy. If you store a zero into memory at some address that say, and you point HL at that address, then you point DE at the address one greater than HL, and then you set the BC, the length, to some value, and then you do an LDIR, what happens, it copies that zero that I just said I poked in there at the address in HL to the address in DE, which I said by definition is one greater than HL, right? Then it does this, goes back, and then what does it do? It just leapfrogs. It takes that one byte and replicates it and pads out and clears out memory. That's how you can wipe out and clear out memory. But let's say I want to not clear it out, but I want to move a bunch of bytes in memory to uh, some other address, but it might overlap the data that I'm copying. And by that, I mean uh, copy the contents from, say, address 10 to address 20, but I need to copy 100 bytes. That would be destructive because I'd wreck stuff before I finished. Well, if I do it backwards, that won't happen. Think about it, all right? Uh, same thing, single byte, uh, multiple bytes. Here's the compare thing, all right? So we repeat until, uh, what do we got? CPIR, repeat until A equals whatever. So what happens is you want to compare A with, with what's in memory at the address in HL register, right? Notice this is A minus HL. How do you compare two things? What you do is you subtract them from each other. If, the, if you get zero, then they're equal, right? That's how it, that's how you do a compare, okay? So, and then, you know, so what you're going to do is subtract them, you're going to increment, just like you would kind of like an LDIR, but you're not storing it anywhere. You're just reading it and comparing it to the accumulator by subtracting it. And later on, it says, uh, repeat until A is equal to the, you know, the, the byte that, it, that HL has been incremented and points to uh, equals the, the accumulator value, and then stop. So it's, go find a byte, okay? So if you're a C programmer and you use something like Sterlan, this is the instruction you could use in the Z80. You just simply search for a zero because the length of a string is equal to 
in you know a C string is equal to uh, however many bytes there are between the beginning of the string and the null that terminates it. So if you set a, a equals zero when you do a CPIR on uh, you know the the string that's stored in HL register with a length right uh, in BC, I guess that would be a uh, str n length. Uh, you can only search so far kind of thing, and then it'll figure out where the uh, zero is. And it'll leave HL pointing at the address where it's found, okay? So you can go through here and find all the other ones. Eventually, where are we? It's this one here. This is the block search group. Here's the 8th bit arithmetic and logic group. This is the only thing that really uses the ALU. Look up here. Remember what I was saying? Oh, you got all these instructions and all this so-called engineering. All you're doing is moving stuff around. That's it. We haven't done a dang thing yet. We've gotten stuff out of memory. We've stored stuff into memory. We relocate it. Copy it between registers. Copy it in mass quantity. Go find things. We haven't done anything yet. <laughs> okay? These are the only instructions that actually do anything. Add to things. Okay, thank you. What can you do? You already know these notations. You're done. Look at me. I'm teaching. Add. Add with a carry. All right? This is so that you can add multi-byte values together. One at a time. If you add two bytes together and you get a carry, let's say you have a you know an eight byte integer value. What do you do? You pretend you're in first grade all over again. You add the least significant bytes first. Right? You start at the right and you work your way over to the left. Add them together. If you got a carry, what do you do? You gotta incorporate that carry into the next thing over on the left. So what happens is you need to add instruction for the for where you start in the least significant byte, and then when if there's a carry out of that byte, the carry flag is set, and you can automatically just simply say if the carry is set, add an extra one when you're doing the next byte. If you're you know leaping leapfrogging through memory, one byte at a time in order to propagate the carry. So that's why you have add and add carry, all right? And you can add different things. You can add a register to A and, and an immediate numeric value that's stored right here, right inside the instruction to A. Notice all of them have to only store the answers in A, okay? I can't add a register, you know, to the D register and store it in D. No, no, no. <laughs> only A, okay? Look down here. So again, the same doofus that made the primes uh, inconsistent probably made this inconsistent. Add with a carry a comma s. Add a comma you know whatever kind of operands numeric register out of memory using indexes and stuff like that. When you subtract, you don't put the a in here. Thank you, Mr. Consistency. Same dingus probably did this one. Now most assemblers today allow you to say sub s. Because look and see what happens here. A is set to the value of A minus S. Well, look at add. A. So here's the add. You say A comma and then a register and you subtract. Oh, no. God forbid I put the A in here to be consistent, right? <laughs> Thank you very little. Like I said, most modern assemblers allow you to put an A in here so that the thing is readable and sane and useful the way it should have been on day one. But technically, <laughs> the subtract instruction, you don't specify the target address. This might actually be an Intel issue. I should go up and look up the instruction they use on the 8080 for this operation. Maybe they couldn't put the accumulator in there for that reason. I don't know. Notice all the logic operations here. Also leaves out the A comma. Okay. So and S means and the accumulator with, you know, the S operand here. Okay. S here means source register. I'm sure there's a table over here. Our register here, S is any one of these items, okay? You can use the a register, a numeric value, the HL indirect, the index uh, indirects, and stuff like that. The indicated bits replace the triple zero, blah, 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 okay? I didn't know you could use the, well, yeah, that's fine. If you're going to use these in, these here, by the way, they're extended uh, Z80 mnemonics, and they're going to have an extra byte and some other stuff. Uh, when we run the assembler, you'll see how uh, how all that works. How am I doing on time here? Egads, this is a mile long. Let me wrap this part up. We'll do a walkthrough of an assembler program in another video because this is already an eon. Uh, if you got it this far, thank you very much for watching. I hope you got something out of it. 
Um, really quickly in the last minute or two, let's just rifle through the rest of this table. Increment and decrement means add one to something, right? Or subtract one. All right. So uh, again, same notation. You now know how to read this table. You understand the notation. You know what all this stuff means. You know what that is. You know when to check the comments and stuff like that. You can figure the rest of this stuff out completely on your own. The uh, general, remember when I said, what the heck are these? I couldn't remember. These are clear carry flag. Negate the value in the accumulator. Uh, complement the accumulator. That's a little different. Negate means two's complement. Complement is one's complement. Okay, A bar means flip all the bits. This means flip all the bits and add one, although they show it differently. Zero minus A is another way of saying take the ones complement and then add one to that result. Okay, that's the difference between these two inserts. DAA is a uh, instruction that harkens back to the days when Z80 chips were used in desktop calculators. This has to do with dealing with packed decimal math, so you can do work in decimal rather than in uh, binary. Uh, and there are pros and cons to the doing it both ways. This is necessary because it's really difficult to represent numbers like one tenth in in uh, binary uh, and get an accurate result. Okay, uh, most people don't use this anymore. There's a neat trick you can do with this to create hex dumps, and I'll show you that in a program at some point when we write a nice CPM bias or something like that. Set carry, carry flag, do nothing, stop the CPU, enable, disable interrupts, change the interrupt modes. What do we got going here? 16-bit arithmetic. Guess what these do, okay? Add, subtract things to the 16-bit registers. Here's rotate. There's a gazillion operations, uh, op, um, variations of rotations and shifting that you can do, which have, you know, just move all the bits to the left, move them to the right, in incorporate the carry, don't incorporate the carry, things like that. We'll talk a lot about this when we look at writing a driver for the SD card, because we're going to have to ship bits out one at a time in order to do an SPI transfer without any hardware help. We're going to have to do what we call bit banging, and we're going to be shifting things back and forth in there. So I'll talk about those in that code. Here's more shift instructions. Okay. Here's what I said earlier. Remember, you can say, "Oh, uh, you know, is 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 some specific bit number on or off in some register?" Okay. Are they on? I can turn it on. I can turn it off. I can uh, it's set and reset, and then I can also bit means test. I want to ask, is it there? See, the zero flag will be set. If the bit that I'm asking about, bit number B is a one, otherwise it'll be set to a zero. If you look at these flags in here, we can find the headings here. Where's the zero flag right here, okay? Uh, that's why it says up and down. The zero flag can change. When this instruction is done, this will always be set to a one, whatever that one is. The H flag, which we call the half carry, that has to do with decimal math. Uh, so that's what those are. Here's how you branch. You jump. Load the program counter with some number. I want to go somewhere else. I don't want to be here anymore. I want to go into a loop, okay? Here's a conditional jump. If condition is true, then go there. Otherwise, don't. Well, what are the conditions you can use? Well, you can ask if the zero flag is on or off, carry flag on and off, parity, blah, 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 okay? And there's a bunch of different variations on how you can do jumping. You can jump to an absolute address. You can jump to a relative address, okay? Which here, notice it says add some number to the program counter versus simply take an absolute value and stuff it in the program counter, right? Just different ways to write your code, all right? Different options. So here's an interesting one. Jump to HL in parentheses. Now, I always get this wrong when I'm thinking about it. Now, be careful. Look what this says. HL, take the HL register contents, stick it in the program counter. Notice this over here has the parentheses around it. This is one of those times where you know, I'm like, I got to wonder what they were thinking. Uh, the HL register in this context does not refer to a memory location where uh, you go under the memory, you grab a value, and you get that value and store it somewhere, like it would in the load instruction. In this case, if you say jump to HL in parentheses, you literally are setting the program counter to the value of HL. 
It's in the HL pair. It doesn't go out into memory and get the, the value after the address that HL points at. I got to wonder if this is an inconsistency. Uh, I don't like it, but well, who am I? Just some dude on YouTube. Same thing for the index registers, okay? DJNZ is kind of neat. In one instruction, you can subtract one from the B register. If it's equal to zero, you go to the next instruction. Otherwise, if it's not zero, you can take a relative branch by adding E to the program counter okay remember e can be negative so quite often you'll say uh you'll put a label in your program like loop and then you'll say do a bunch of stuff and you'll say djnz uh, comma loop and it'll say you know maybe you'll say uh, iterate until b you know equals zero kind of a thing it'll just go around and around and around uh the idea is this uses of less bytes then it use a you know if you decremented b with an instruction and then you said jump if uh non zero back to loop it would use more bytes and it would take more time so this is an efficiency thing right this is only 2 bytes right now it assumes that you can get to where you want to go by adding a simple 8 bit signed value to the program counter so this is going to only branch so far away okay but it's it's very common very handy yeah in fact there's a little note that talks about it right here okay Call subroutine, return a subroutine. These are special for handling interrupts and stuff like that. We'll talk more about this when we create interrupt handlers. Restart instructions go back to the 80, 80 days. These are just fancy ways to call a subroutine with only one byte value instead of, you know, they're, they're, they're a fixed address, okay? So the restart, you know, 20 uh, or something like that, we'll just say, you know, go and, 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 and call a subroutine that starts at 20. Uh, the address, uh, 0, 0, 2, 0 in hex, all right? Uh, that's part of the interrupt handling, uh, very commonly used in interrupt handling in the 8080, okay? No, you got inputs and outputs, I and I, I and I, are, these are just like load I, load increment and repeat, but this is input from the device, increment and repeat. You can copy a whole bunch of bytes from a device and then store it into a uh, into memory in a range of, of addresses, okay? Load one byte, load, you know, uh, 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 many bytes, all right, and some variations of how you want to do this. Is the address a numeric value, an immediate absolute address? Is it an address that's in the C register that I want to read from? Okay, and uh, so on. What else we got? The output, same as the inputs with repeating and so on. In increment and decrement, do you want to, uh, when you're copying into memory, do you go up, do you go down in, in addresses, right? Uh, what I got in summary of uh, all the things that modify the flags and why this is every instruction in the Z80. All right, you now know all of them. You got the general gist of this table. This is your cheat card, your green card if you're in a uh, you know a mainframe guy. And if you if this is you need a little more detail, you know to go grab this older manual and read the long form description here. If you can't find what you're looking for, you go grab yourself the new one, but keep in mind that the OCR that created this copy could have some interesting typographical creativity going on in it, all right? This is really everything, okay? Uh, I guess in closing, one last tidbit. Let me show you the modern version of this table. So here we go, all right? Now, you, clearly this is a prettier thing and you can cut and paste if you want to, although I can't imagine that would have a huge value in here. There's like a little bit of a narrative up here that talks about um, the interrupt modes and uh, what it means to do certain things. And it also talks about the fact that, you remember the DD and the FD and the CB, these extended opcodes for the Z80, uh, how they uh, relate to the table, okay? Uh, it'll also talk about the fact that they are including the so-called undocumented instructions and what they do in here, right? So this guy, Sean Young, you'll find some documents around the internet that this guy has written. Uh, in fact, there's like a, another document somewhere that's called like the undocumented Z80 operations. And he wrote a nice narrative of what they all do and how they all work. Okay. Look, here's the registers again. Here's what all the flag register bits are. Super summarized, right? How, which interrupt modes do what? And then we get into this table here. So let's look and see what's going on here. What's the difference between the one we just looked at and this one? Remember R and R prime? 
The very next instruction in the old one was R and N. So he has these two additional lines in here. See these asterisks? Every one of these that has an asterisk on it, these are undocumented instructions that people have just simply exhaustively run tests and see what the Z80 does. Well, it turns out, if you want to, you can load, uh, what, the P and P prime? See this index register high, index register low? Okay, if you put a DD followed by, you know, a byte that's 0, 1, and then you have, you know, two different three-bit values for P and P prime, you can do these other operations that you otherwise can't do. I can get the index register of the high half of the index register, and I can copy it into one of these registers if I want to. Same thing in the low half of the index register. Officially, there's no way to do that. All right. If you really wanted to do it and you didn't want to use these undocumented instructions, the only way to do it would be like to push it into the stack or store it into memory. And then later on, go back and use an instruction like uh, load R comma uh, like HL to get it out of memory or load R comma where's like the numeric uh, this one. You could say load it into the accumulator from some absolute address if you wanted to. Right. This takes a lot longer. 13 plus the time it took to store the index register in the first place in that example. Or you can do this, okay? Now, it's not officially a legitimate instruction. Use at your own risk. So he has uh, the P's and Q's. Mind your P's and Q's, right? Uh, the P registers are various uh, normal uh, general purpose rigs and the index X. The same thing happens with index Y, all right? So you're going to see kind of a, a pattern in here. Of all the undocumented instructions really kind of involve the index registers mostly. Uh, I'm looking for more asterisks over here. Uh, da -da -da -da. That might actually be all of them. Uh, then again, no. I can add and uh, do other things using the uh, half of the index registers as well. Okay. Uh, what else can we do? We can increment them. Sure, why not? Um, is that the end of it? No. Uh, what do we got? 16-bit arithmetic. Nothing undocumented in there. Uh, negate, that's not an asterisk, those are footnotes. Rotate, here's some undocumented things I can rotate. The Wow, look at how long that instruction takes to do. If I do a rotate, what the heck is this thing doing? Go out into memory and get a value at index plus D, rotate it left, and then store it into a register. <laughs> wow! <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, great. Why not? Oh, no, I said that wrong. Wow. And Well, you know, I said it right, but then finish that by storing it back into the memory. So you, essentially you're using this register R as a temporary register, but you're going to keep a copy of it in a normal register when this whole operation is done. Holy shimoleons. Wow. <laughs> Eh, if you need it, great. It's good to know it's there. Right now we see all the, again, the rotate and shift instructions down here. Notice something that's going on here, by the way. You've got RLA. That means rotate A left. Look what that really means if we zoom in on this picture here for a minute. Take these eight bits move them to the left one bit. So bit seven goes into the carry flag. The carry flag comes back around to zero. Zero goes to one, one goes to two, and so on. All right, that's what a rotate is. It just shuffles them around in a big circle. And this says, go through uh, the carry and around. So that's really kind of like a nine-bit uh, rotation. This one here is an eight-bit rotation. And, oh, by the way, keep a copy of what used to be in, in bit number seven over here in the carry flag. There's a subtle difference between these two. Look very closely. This one's called RLCA, and this one's called RLA, okay? They have one byte op codes, and these are 8080 compatible instructions. Notice down here there's an RL, and notice that this RL does the exact same thing as RLA does up here, okay? RLA here can only be done on the accumulator. This one down here, you say RL, and you can give it another register if you want. The thing is, if you 
rotate left, space, A, and you look at how this instruction is encoded, it's an extended Z80 operation, and it'll take longer to do it. Okay, so if you're going to rotate A to the left, you really want to use this instruction up here. You don't want to do it RL space A. Be careful of these inconsistencies, all right? That's a gotcha. I fell for that a couple of times. Um, but you can RL the B register and so on. You can do different registers with these down here. That's the point. So there's fancier things you can do, but they take more time. Uh, and what else we got? Bit set. You saw all these before. Increment, decrement, and all that. All right, so this is a prettier diagram, but be careful. It includes uh, special uh, extra undocumented features of the Z80, so you don't want to get confused if you're avoiding them. Otherwise, you know, just keep keep aware of the fact that if there's an asterisk over here, all right, I'm going to find one again, uh, then it, it signifies that it is an extended instruction like this one here. Okay? So next time we'll run some assembly language program, but run the assembler and uh, we'll watch what the uh, source code and the output really looks like and kind of how you see what's going on, c connect all these dots together. Anyway, sorry this got into uh, extra innings here. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.